On the 22nd of April, 1915, French, Canadian, and Algerian troops sat hulled in their squalid trenches near the town of Ypres in Belgium. With rats feasting on the dead, thick mud that could swallow a man, and a steady barrage of thunderous artillery shells landing nearby, this was already hell on an unimaginable scale. As the artillery barrage finally ended, those in the trenches steeled themselves for the expected German attack. Men gripped their guns nervously, peering desperately out into no man's land for any sign of an approaching enemy. An airy silence then descended on the battlefield. Suddenly, confusion began rippling through the lines. Instead of a torrent of German soldiers heading towards them, all that could be seen was a strange, slightly green gas drifting silently across the massacred landscape. As it reached the trenches, the first coughs could be heard, which quickly turned into desperate gasping and terrified screams. The first successful mass use of a chemical weapon was underway. The events that day sparked outrage among those it had been used on, but it didn't take long for everybody to get in on the act. Any kind of self-righteous condemnation was soon replaced by a murderous chemical weapons tit-for-tat that eventually cost the lives of an estimated 90,000 men during World War I. All sides eventually ended up using chlorine gas during World War I, but sadly, this was just the start. Phosgene and then mustard gas quickly replaced chlorine gas as the murder weapon of choice as the trenches of northeast France, Belgium, and on the Eastern Front degenerated into an apocalyptical nightmare. It is telling that despite the utter devastation caused by chemical attacks, World War I proved to be the first and only war where chemical weapons were used by both sides on such a scale. Even the frazzled psychopathic mind of Adolf Hitler stopped short of chemical weapons, though it must be said that this was perhaps down to the fact that effective countermeasures against chemical warfare, such as gas masks, had drastically diminished their capabilities. While this was certainly the first major attempt to use chemical weapons on such a scale, it was not the first time chemicals or poisons had been used on the battlefield. To gauge the origins of all of this, it really depends on what you consider to be chemical weapons. Greek myths and ancient Indian epics are some of the earliest references to poisons being used in war, principally through poisoned arrowheads, but there's also reference to toxic smoke. In China, the use of arsenical smoke goes all the way back to 1000 BC, while there is also mention of the smoke from burning balls of toxic plants and vegetables being blown into tunnels that have been dug by besieging armies. In the 5th century BC, Spartan soldiers were said to have placed a smoldering mixture of wood, pitch, and sulfur at the foot of the walls of an Athenian city they were attacking in the hope that it would incapacitate the defenders, while in the 3rd century AD, a group known as the Sasanians used bitumen and sulfur crystals to defend their town in modern-day Syria against the invading Roman army. The result was a toxic plume of sulfur dioxide, which was said to kill 19 Romans in only two minutes. The English purportedly used lime mortars to hurl quicklime, the old name, the calcium oxide, at a fleet of French ships sometime in the 13th century, blinding many on board those ships. As the following centuries passed, there were consistent stories of various chemicals being used in combat, but Nothing really concise. These attacks were usually experimental, to say the least, and it's telling that nothing concrete really emerged as an effective form of chemical warfare. Things began to change as the world barreled headlong into the industrial age. The development of modern chemistry, as well as the blossoming chemical industry that accompanied it, introduced many intriguing and highly successful chemicals to the more developed nations. These included sulfuric acid, sodium carbonate, ammonium chloride, and ammonium sulfate, among many others. At this point, there was practically no mention of using chemicals for war. Instead, they were almost entirely focused on their industrial and everyday uses. But, of course, humans are going to human, and it didn't take long for devious minds to begin conjuring up far more destructive uses for these new chemicals than were currently appearing. In 1854, Leon Playfair, British Secretary of the Science and Art Department, proposed using caracadel cyanide artillery shells during the Crimean War, but despite his idea being accepted by some, the powers that be described his plan as bad a mode of warfare as poisoning the wells of the enemy, and they rejected the proposal. 
good for them. During the American Civil War, we see the first mention of the topic of our video today. John Doughty, a school teacher from New York, proposed filling a 254mm 10-inch artillery shell with liquid chlorine that would then be fired at Confederate troops before dispersing deadly chlorine gas. But again, the plan was not taken up. For many, the use of such a weapon remained a barbaric act beyond even the horrors of the American Civil War. Considering its absolutely hellish dark side, chlorine comes with a catalogue of everyday uses. Perhaps the most well-known is its use in swimming pools to disinfect the water, while also being heavily involved in the sanitation process for sewage and industrial waste. It's also used in the production of paper and cloth and can be found in many cleaning products, including household bleach, which is chlorine diluted with water. Sodium chloride, the most common compound of chlorine, has been used for thousands of years, but element 17 on the periodic table wasn't studied in any great detail until 1774, when Swedish chemist Carl Wilhelm Scheele produced chlorine by reacting manganese dioxide with hydrogen chloride. His early experiments revealed several uses for chlorine, such as its bleaching effect, but also its murderous effect on insects. By the 19th century, chlorine was being used for disinfection, both on a small scale and much larger, most notably the Paris cholera outbreak of 1832, when chlorine gas was dissolved in lime water to disinfect large parts of the French capital. It was also used to clean and deodorize hospitals, sewers, prisons, stables, and it was even used during the embalming of dead bodies. In 1908, Jersey City in New Jersey installed the first continuous application of chlorination to drinking water in the United States, and it quickly became a key component of water purification across the entire country. But over the following decade, its use would swing from the sanitary to the murderous. While the events of the 22nd of April 1915, as the Second Battle of Ypres got underway, may represent the first time a mass chemical attack caused significant casualties, it was not the first use of gas during World War I. Now, before we dive into the full horror of chemical warfare during the Great War, let's start with the Hague Convention of 1899, in which all major nations gathered to agree on a set of rules relating to war and war crimes in the body of secular international law. One of these points, ratified by every nation present, with the exception of the United States, was a declaration concerning the prohibition of the use of projectiles with the sole object to spread asphyxiating poisonous gases. In short, this now meant that it was an international crime to use asphyxiating poisonous gases on the battlefield. And I suppose it must have made a lot of sense at the time. The true horror of what chlorine gas could do was slowly emerging, and just 15 years before the nightmare in Europe began, there still appeared to be a level of decency regarding war that would soon evaporate. It's also worth clarifying the wording of the document, because it left a slight loophole that would later be exploited in the early days of World War I. Asphyxiation means that the body isn't getting the required amount of oxygen it needs, which can lead to a loss of consciousness, brain injury, or ultimately death. However, this did leave open the possibility of using tear gas, which has a relatively short period of effectiveness and is rarely disabling or deadly. Therefore, it was not classed under the Hague Declaration of 1899, which brings us nicely back to World War I. The French used one-inch grenades filled with ethyl bromacetate to create tear gas in August 1914, but the gas produced was so small it wasn't even detected by the German soldiers. It was supposed to demobilize. On the 31st of January 1915, German artillery fired 18,000 shells containing liquid exorbromide tear gas on Russian soldiers stationed on the Rorka River west of Warsaw during the Battle of Bolomov. Fortunately for the Russians, the chemical froze instead of vaporizing, and this revolutionary form of attack came to nothing. If there was a grey area related to the use of tear gas under the rules of the Hague Convention of 1899, the use of chlorine gas was an entirely different matter. Numerous German chemical companies, including BASF, Heusch, and Bayer, had been making chlorine as a byproduct of their dye manufacturing for several years. As World War I began, and as the true nature of this new potential form of warfare presented itself, Germany and other countries involved in the war began testing a wide range of weaponry that might give them an edge on the battlefield. The German gas warfare program was 
headed by Fritz Haber, who was working out of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry in Berlin. In partnership with some of the major German chemical companies at the time, Haber began exploring ways of discharging chlorine gas against enemy trenches. Chlorine is a diatomic gas, meaning it contains two atoms that are chemically bonded, and it is around two and a half times denser than air. It comes with a pale green color, a stale metallic taste, and an odor that has been described as a mix of pineapple and pepper, though to our modern noses, we would probably say that it smells like bleach. After its release, it almost immediately begins to irritate the eyes, nose, lungs, and throat of those exposed, but things can quickly become a whole lot worse. Chlorine can react with water in the lungs to form hydrochloric acid, which destroys the tissue and quickly leads to either long-term lung damage or death. With lower concentrations, if the gas doesn't reach the lungs, it can still cause coughing, vomiting, and eye irritation. In short, you don't want to be anywhere in the vicinity of a shell landing with chlorine gas inside. As the Germans began finalizing their plans to use chlorine on the battlefield, special troop units, Pioneer Regiments 35 and 36, were created to handle this new form of warfare under the command of Otto Peterson, with Haber and Friedrich Kirschbaum as advisors. And these units weren't simply comprised of your everyday soldiers. In fact, they were filled with some of the best chemists and physicists around, including future Nobel laureates James Frank, Gustav Hertz, and Otto Hahn. As the gas began to reach the first soldiers on the 22nd of April 1915, chaos quickly ensued. Nothing like it had ever been seen, and within seconds the air was filled with desperate screams as the gas began to seep into the lungs of those on the front lines. A total of 150 tons of chlorine gas deployed in 5,730 cylinders had been fired from the German lines across a front measuring roughly 6.4 kilometers or 4 miles. The result was hellish bedlam as some soldiers simply collapsed into the trenches, never to stand up again, while thousands turned and ran, abandoning their line, desperate to escape the mysterious, deadly gas pouring through the area. It's thought that around 1,100 men died in the world's first mass chemical attack. If the Germans had hoped that the chlorine gas would sow enough chaos that a gap in the front would appear, they were entirely correct. Across the front, men were fleeing the gas and away from the German line. But quite inexplicably, the Germans weren't entirely prepared. Whether it was from shock at the devastating effect the gas was having, a fear of what it might do to them, or simply poor battlefield management, only small numbers of Germans made it to the enemy trenches. But they were quickly thrown back by a counterattack. Like so much of World War I, a savage loss had yielded absolutely no gain on the battlefield. In many ways, what occurred on the 22nd of April 1915 had simply been a test of this new weapon's capability, and while no tangible military gain had been achieved, its deadly effect had been astonishingly clear. The public announcement of the attack was met with international outrage, but the Germans barely skipped a beat. Chlorine gas was used a further three times in the coming weeks on the Western Front, and for the first time in the East against the Russians on the 6th of August 1915, an event that has come to be known by the name Attack of the Dead Men. As German chlorine cylinders began landing in and around the Ossowitz Fortress in what is northeast Poland today, the deadly gas quickly began to decimate the Russian units defending the structure. Just to make sure, the Germans then poured conventional onto the fortress, a total of 1,700 Russians dying either from the gas or the bullets and shells. As the barrage ended, German soldiers stood and began making their way forward, expecting little to no resistance, but how wrong they were. Suddenly, Russian soldiers began rising defiantly from defensive positions, many coughing horribly, foaming at the mouth, with blood and even parts of their own lungs being forced out. In what must be one of the most astonishing acts of World War I, and perhaps in any war, around 100 Russians, many on the verge of death, staggered forward to meet thousands of approaching Germans. Even to the most battle-hardened troops, what came lurching towards the German soldiers was too much. Upon seeing the horrifying state of the Russians and their quite relentless drive, even under the most appalling conditions, most simply turned and fled, with some describing what they had seen as zombie-like, hence the name, Attack of the Dead Men. This tiny detachment of Russians somehow managed to push back a reported 7,000 German soldiers. But it certainly wasn't just the Germans who used chemical weapons. They may have lit the spark, but pretty soon every major nation embroiled in the conflict was using them. While chlorine gas was soon replaced by more effective methods of killing, it still accounted for the largest amount of chemical weapons used in World War I, with 93,800 tons produced throughout the conflict. The first British use of chlorine gas during the Battle of Luz on the 25th of September 1915 was nothing short of disastrous as a change in wind direction blew the poison back over the British soldiers. 
Despite its horrific effects, the use of chlorine in World War I was fairly limited. It could be easily seen and smelt, which made surprise attacks impossible. The gas was also water-soluble, meaning that anybody with a water-soaked rag could place it over their mouths and noses and they'd probably be okay. There were even stories of urine-soaked rags being used effectively, which is an unpleasant thought and yet infinitely better than the alternative. Once gas masks became part and parcel of every soldier's kit, their effectiveness became even less. But while the physical numbers of those killed by chlorine gas was quite small, the psychological effect was enormous. Many soldiers throughout the war claimed they had been gassed when no gas attack had taken place. The smoke of the battlefield, along with the psychological trauma, could quite easily play tricks on the mind. However, soldiers soon learned how to effectively counter chlorine attacks. As strange as it sounds, the very worst thing you could do was to run away, as any form of movement inflamed the lungs and would quickly lead to death. It was better to stay put and preferably to stand above the trenches because the gas would sink to the bottom. Easier said than done, though, with a wall of guns looking to pick off those crazy enough to stick their head above. But as I mentioned earlier, chlorine gas was quickly replaced by more deadly chemical weapons during the war, namely phosgene and mustard gas, both of which killed far more people than chlorine ever did. It's thought that 190,000 tons of chemical gases were used during World War One, affecting 1.3 million people directly, leading to 90,000 deaths. And this wasn't just soldiers. Roughly 100,000 to 260,000 of these casualties were civilians, people unlucky enough to be downwind of these horrific weapons when they were released. Chlorine gas was rarely used after World War I until quite recently when it was used by insurgents in Iraq in 2007 and by the Syrian government during the still ongoing Syrian civil war between 2016 and 2018. In terms of destructive weapons, chlorine gas is fairly low grade, which is why it's barely been used since the trenches of World War I, but it lit the fuse on a series of steps that has gradually developed deadlier and harder to trace chemical weapons. Today, we worry about Novichok, Sarin, VX, and Cyclosarin, weapons infinitely worse than what was seen on the battlefield on the 22nd of April 1915, but nonetheless, certainly the continuation of humanity's horrifying desire to kill as many people as quickly and as silently as possible. Today, there are chemical weapons that could effectively destroy vast swaths of populations in an instant, but it all began in the muddy nightmare that was the Second Battle of Ypres during the First World War, with all of green smoke floating silently towards unsuspecting soldiers.